hard to tell if we are live. I'm going <laughs> to, I think we are live. Okay. Depends on which screen I look at, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody, to our Tuesday afternoon live stream. Uh, this week, I am your host, Dana Morningstar. And with me is the wonderful, lovely, and talented Angie Atkinson. Angie, thank you for being here. I am always happy to be here, Dana. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I am always happy to have you. So, um, oh, I guess I should mention the date. Today's date is May 26, 2020. So sure. I guess let's see if some people are hopping on here. But before we really get going, um, one of the topics that we were wanting to discuss has to do with the importance of a support system. Mm. And so probably quite a few of you know this, but um, just how important it is when we're changing any type of behavior um, or starting something new, how important it is to have a support system that's encouraging for that. And research has shown that when it comes to uh, leave, successfully leaving an abusive relationship, those that have been able to get out and stay out are those that have had a solid support system in place. Now, of course, this is a challenge because there's so many people out there that have lost their support system um, because of this relationship for any number of reasons. Maybe they distance themselves from friends and family. Maybe friends and family distance themselves from the person, or maybe the abusive partner was pushing them to cut off contact with them. So I guess, Angie, what are some tips, what are some ideas that you have for how people can cultivate a healthy support system? In well, so I think, first of all, obviously we're gonna be a little bit like we talked about before, a little bit limited right now as as we're some some of us are still in um, sheltering in place and things like that. Um, but in general, I would suggest uh, reaching out to current and old friends. Sometimes we lose our friends uh, and our family members that would otherwise be supportive to us when we're in these relationships. And so I think one of the best things you can do is start to reach out to those people. Um, but also, of course, to join survivor groups on Facebook but not just like you mentioned earlier, Dana, not just survivor groups, because eventually you're going to want to stop thinking about narcissistic abuse <laughs> and mm -hmm. you're going to want to focus on things that are of interest to you outside of that. Um, and so, for example, one of the groups I recently joined, this is so silly, um, <laughs> but I, I've started two groups, actually. I, I started building fairy gardens because they're fun. And, and I saw that on <laughs> Facebook for you guys yeah. who have who don't follow Angie on Facebook. Um, <laughs> Can, is that okay? If you yeah, can, totally. Okay. Yeah. Go check out these fairy gardens. They're freaking darling. Mm -hmm. um, Angie Adkinson on Facebook. Yeah, this is on my personal page, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can follow me on that page as well. Um, so fairy gardens, they're just silly and fun. And I enjoy doing them. And they're kind of incredibly therapeutic in certain weird ways. Uh, anyway, my son even built one for his girlfriend. I thought that was so cute. Um, <laughs> but so I joined a couple fairy garden groups on Facebook, people who are really into gardening, doing the little fairy gardens. And I thought, how fun. I mean, there's literally a group for everything on Facebook. So almost anything you're interested in, you can find other people who are interested. And I think that's a really healthy way to interact um, and keep your, your head out of the narcissist game. You know, do things mm -hmm. that make you happy. I mean, these fairy gardens are silly, but they're so fun and you can make them out of almost anything. So like I, I broke one of our really pretty bowls got broken the other day. And at first I was a little bit upset. I thought, oh no, wait, <laughs> fairy garden. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it changes your, your whole perspective. Anyway, so that's something, um, pattern interrupts for in the moment. So in the moment, if you are, um, feeling, stressed out or you're thinking, oh, I might call them, I'm missing them or whatever, you know, a pattern interrupt can kind of shift you out of that moment. Something like standing up and going into a different part of the house or any sort of self-care, like brushing your teeth, your hair, taking a shower, going for a walk, um, deep breathing, affirmations, all that kind of stuff. Those types of things um, can kind of stop you in the moment. And then when it comes to like uh, we talk often, Dana, about community support. We talk about uh, going in and uh, joining a meetup group, meetup.com. There are so many different ones like that. But of course, again, this is going to be <laughs> after the quarantine is over where you live. Mm -hmm. um, but churches as well um, and synagogues and other types of community and religious uh, groups can be helpful. But 
there, there's a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. And I yeah. think, I think that's um, some really great advice, you know, and so many of these groups, I guess it's, I haven't been on meetup.com in a very long time, but oh, wow. um, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these places have moved their groups to online. Mm. I'll have to check. Cause I know a lot of other places have. So, um, and, and two, for those of you out there that are not religious or um, even if you're atheist or agnostic or mm -hmm. kind of in that, you know, um, spiritual, Pagan, but not whatever. religious. Well, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of wherever you are on that spectrum. Consider too, there's uh, um, Unitarian churches out mm -hmm. there that are non-denominational and their focus is more on just love. And so it's, if you're just looking for like a positive energy kind of place without, and they have a wide range of people. They, I've, um, I used to go to a church, a Unitarian church here in town and they, I have been to, um, there was an atheist funeral there once, which was really interesting. Um, they talk about Buddhism. They talk about, um, they have psalm, uh, not psalms, um, but psalms sometimes, um, hymns, and kind of they take a little bit from every different religion, and sometimes they just read inspiring things. So mm -hmm. that's a thought for some people out there. And um, yeah, these online communities are good because there is, I think a, another big part of healing is... Um, Ha having hope having optimism for the future and that this there is a life after this yeah. but that life doesn't I mean it really doesn't just happen we have to actually consciously create it and um, going out there and and filling up your life with positive enjoyable things uh, just Z had mentioned um, you know needing fun in her life yes planning for fun things. I love the fairy garden idea. I just think it's so darling. And what a wonderful gift that you could make for somebody yes. too. And it's good for your inner child. I found myself yes. finding parts of myself that I didn't even remember were there. Like mm -hmm. my daughter was laughing at me because I was like, oh, look, the fairies are doing all the things. And <laughs> she was like, mom, <laughs> stop. <laughs> but, but it was really, that's exactly what I was doing was indulging my inner child. So in that process, I found myself having silly fun um, it, it's it's been helpful so <laughs> yeah. anyway yeah I, I, I noticed something oh metamorphosis that I like the fairy garden ideal idea I feel like stuff like that allows me to engage my mind in another place for a while I did this with jigsaw puzzles at the beginning of the quarantine yeah 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 and I think it's good that's exactly it yeah it absolutely is there's a um, a term for this too. It's called sublimation. And it's when we take, um, basically when we take the energy in the focus of pain and we channel it into something positive. So if we realize here's the thing with emotions, that energy doesn't just go away. Right. It, it's going to come out some way and we can either consciously decide how that's going to come out and focus it onto something that's constructive or it's going to come out as a default because we don't want to deal with it and it's more more likely than not going to come out as destructive mm. and so whether that's you know spending too much money or um kind of doing things in excess yeah. um but if we can focus that energy and i think too for a lot of people in our community who tend to be more um kind of others oriented like that tends to be a bigger driver for them than actually helping themselves. Something that can help is, is creating things for other people. Yes. So Fairy that gardens can, or other things. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Learning to totally. crochet, making baby mm -hmm. blankets for, um, um, or, or, you know, making blankets for foster kids. Yeah, um, absolutely. Things like this can really give a person a sense of purpose and putting that energy to a positive use. Yeah. And, and just for the record, something like making blankets for foster kids, that's a powerful, tiny, but, but profound way that people could help. I mean, I just thought anyway, yeah. I, my grandma had foster kids when I was growing up in the house and I, I got to know some of them and even, even for part of kindergarten, live with some of them <laughs> mm -hmm. and long wow. story, but anyway, um, and I, and I really, 
I know from a, a strange perspective how um, lost those kids really feel, even though, you know, we were just like, oh, yeah, new kids. They were, you know, and, and at the time I didn't fully understand, but they were certainly experiencing something mm -hmm. much deeper than I knew. But anyway. Yeah. 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 So that's cool. Um, oh, okay. So um, Bonnie, okay, well, I don't know. Do we want to? Yeah, yeah, let's hop in the chat. Okay. Um, Bonnie notes that she broke no contact with her mom. I'm, do you know Bonnie's, I'm sure you know Bonnie's story. A little bit of it, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's been a rough one for her. And she says, it was like nothing ever happened, like as if I had just spoken with her and nothing ever happened. Um, she said it was like Groundhog Day. She didn't miss a beat. Um, so I, I wonder what she, Bonnie, I wonder what you, um, what made you break no contact? Um, if you want to tell us in the chat, but that just, I just want to say this, just because you broke no contact doesn't mean you have to continue to stay in contact. It's, I think a lot of us have a relapse now and then. I even did with my mother. I was trying to, I don't know, reconnect with her a few years ago and it slapped me in the face just like usual, but I still tried. So um, I don't beat yourself up about it, but yeah, that's pretty, uh, I think it's her, her behavior um, probably was maybe unintentional, but, but, but it, probably made you feel like you were unimportant to her because obviously she hadn't noticed your absence. Um, Dana, any thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think it's significant too. Um, well, I think that's part of the, the process of change Yeah, to, to try and try and try again. This is part of the, the process of acceptance too. Of, okay. Is this time going to be different? Oh, no. Okay. This time's not going to be different. Is this time going to be different? Oh, no. Okay. And so then hard. you're going around that mountain until finally a person experiences enough pain that they're motivated to do something different. And then they just accept this is just how it's going to be. And the in part of uh, dysfunctional behavior is dysfunctional communication. And so that's why when we go back to uh, these types of relationships, it's so bizarre because they, the other person, you know, either becomes very punishing and they have no accountability for their actions, which is shocking, or they act like nothing ever happened. And then your jaws on the floor thinking, oh my gosh, how can you just act? But that's how, that's the problem, right? Here's like a great example of problematic communication because they don't, they're not assertive. They don't deal with right. things head on. And if we were to if somebody were to bring things up to try to resolve them, they panic, they get flustered, they get upset because they don't have those skills. Right. And they don't know. All they know is how to either be aggressive, passive aggressive or passive. Yeah. That's and, a valid point. Um, but yeah, going back and experiencing things not working out again is, is part of that process. And I think we all have to, to go through that, to know, to have that peace when we finally get to that point of, you know what, I tried and I, I finally got the clarity that I needed. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. Absolutely. Um, I'm with you hundred percent. And I think, you know, Bonnie, as, as you know, from one daughter of a narcissistic mother to another, I know that there's that part of you that continues to mourn the fact that um, you didn't get the type of normal mom relationship that other people got, but don't um, just mourn it if you need to, but don't beat yourself up personally about it. Just remember that it's not your fault and, and you did everything you could quite literally for that woman over the years. So just mm -hmm. give yourself a big hug from us. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and part of that acceptance too, is if you are going to try to keep communication open with her for for whatever reason is to realize this is how she behaves mm. you know this is what she does she's she been doing like, it for all these years right right she has done absolutely no work to change mm. so it's not it's not realistic for us to assume that any change has taken place when she has no sincere awareness that there's a problem right so having that level of acceptance means accepting the situation and the other person for who they are today. It doesn't mean that we like it. it. doesn't mean that we're okay with it. It means that we see their behavior clearly. And once you do that, then you can start changing your own behavior 
and it just sets you free because then we're not so caught up and well but she should act like this she should be doing this and it's like yeah but that's not the mom you have that's right this is how she behaves and I need to stop and I went through this with my dad for years and years and years it was like you know what I need to quit expecting the situation to be different than it is and once I released and it took many years but once I fully understood the this is where he's at these are his his limitations um it became a lot easier because I wasn't so knocked off guard right every time I encountered something it's like well of course of course he's gonna say that or do that because that's that's who he is you know I think that's uh, something really important that you said right there is limitations um when I started to recognize the mean ways they were treating me and the manipulative behavior as limitations that almost not quite but almost made me feel sorry for my mother and other people that I was dealing with because I could then see them almost as the broken people they were and then when I pulled my own self sort of emotionally back from that situation and I looked at I always like to say I look at like a scientist I looked at it with the facts and the figures and then (laughs) you know and again I could okay, well, that's gaslighting and that's this and that's, you know what I mean? Um, Being able to label the behaviors and all of that most definitely made it less painful. Um, And and maybe, Bonnie, you can remember how to do that and kind of roll back a little bit and remind yourself, you know, you've been with us for, what, three years, Bonnie? Mm -hmm. And, And you know this stuff. And so just remind yourself of what you know and remember that you're not alone and that even though you're in a difficult situation you were a better mom than your mom was and you know so maybe you broke the cycle for your kids that always comforts me when I think about it um that I'm trying to do better for my kids you know whatever it takes yep Mm -hmm. you know and other here's the thing too because she was saying oh I just feel damned if I do damned if I don't my family thinks I suck because I'm not treating my grandma right or grandma their grandma right but Mm -hmm. you know the reality is nobody's ever going to agree with us 100% of the time on the decisions that we make. There's always going to be somebody that thinks you should be doing something different. And a big part of kind of healing from all of this is, is finding out what actions are authentic to you, what actions that you're like, you know what, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And then making peace with that. And then letting go like, okay, they can have opinions, but that doesn't mean that you have to act on them. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Um, uh, Back to our original topic really quick. Metamorphosis noted that adult coloring books can help as well. Uh, Just focusing in on easy tasks that takes a little bit of concentration. And I wanted to bring that up because um, I know I have some free coloring. Well, it's pages you can print out over at Life Makeover Academy. So um, that is something it does work. And, And I'm not the only one with free stuff, but they're just go to Google and type in free adult coloring pages if you have a printer. Um, otherwise, you can buy them pretty cheap from Amazon, the, the coloring books. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because we were talking about our little toolkit for staying out and not Yeah, not getting absolutely. Back in. Yeah. That's a great resource. What was the website again? Or uh, It's, well, like lifemakeoveracademy.teachable.com, but just, just okay. type it into Google. It, um, it's because I've got bunches of different things over there, but this is, I, I can find the link if you want um, and send and put it in there. Hold on. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> it can be there. It's totally free. So it can help you to, um, while we're doing this, I, I think anytime you can, um, here we go. Oh, oh my gosh. There's so many. I, I'm just going to let you all Google it. Cause there's tons and tons of them, <laughs> the free coloring pages, uh, not just mine. So just, Google it and, and, and download what, what you like. And if you have a printer, print it out and use it. But otherwise, like I said, go to Amazon and get any any adult coloring book. They've got ones with, um, like the ones I have are, are Mandela ones, you know, which are mm-hmm. those are Mandela, maybe. <laughs> you know, not the man, but the, the round things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, they're pretty nice. And again, totally free. Just print them out. Um, so yeah, that's it. But there are a lot of little things like that. Um, and, and even like um, those paint, uh, you know, those sip and paint things, you can even get like, um, 
packages that have the it's almost like a paint by number or you can get yourself a canvas and watch there's a bunch of different youtubers who do basically the same teaching that they do in those um paint and sip classes where you you can just have your as long as you get your material ahead of time you can sit there and actually follow along with a youtube video just like you would in a class i think that's pretty cool um, that's really cool i did not yeah. know that yeah, it's a, it's a great idea for a channel, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots of things like that. So tons of different, you know, if you're, even if you're not super artistic, you can still create something pretty cool with that. Um, but anything you can, like you were saying earlier, Dana, kind of anything you can craft or create or make, be a maker of, you know, something um, definitely helps to keep your mind in the right place and and away from things that might be so toxic for you mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and uh bonnie agrees that adult coloring books are a really good way to to help um mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah yeah we have a question here from natalie who asks have you seen a narcissist marry someone they met after you and didn't tell you or break up with you Personally, that has not happened to me, but I have seen that happen in a couple of client cases, something similar to that. Um, they're, they are that small. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest, well, not the nicest possible way. I'm saying it that way to not be rude, um, but they are that way. I've seen that happen. Have you seen that happen, Tina? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Th that was, oh, I think the most, well, <laughs> top five like most devastating things with um the relationship I was in with Jack is he it was the lack of disregard and how he could go from seeming like my best friend and um so in love with me to to nothing like to I meant nothing to him within a span of a matter of minutes and I, I'd never ex encountered that before so um that really threw me for a loop that threw my self-esteem for a loop it threw my mind for a loop um and i don't even it's not even that he necessarily moved on i mean he was cheating he was having sex with all kinds of people the whole time we were dating but Jeez. um yeah but it wasn't that he'd found somebody else necessarily it was just the lack of uh that he could that he could put on such a good act like that's sure. what messed me up but then the second relationship i had with steve he was still married oh, and no. i didn't know it so when he left he went back to his wife Ugh. who i of course then find out he's still married and you know created this whole crazy lie about um his behavior and why he'd been gone and um blah 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 and um didn't miss a beat. I mean, just moved right back in with her and her. I mean, that was so lifetime TV movie. My gosh, at the end of it all, you know, she and I were talking at this point. And, um, and of course, we're realizing all of the lies and anyways, but yeah, I mean, it, the, how fast they move on, it just goes to show you that they don't have their feelings don't have a lot of depth, right? And their promises don't have a lot of depth. So they, there's just not that, um, that deep connection there. And this is why, you know, for so many of us, I think are so flattered when we meet people that are very quick to profess their love. They're very quick to um, tell us how much we mean to them. And it can seem like, oh, this is so wonderful. I finally found th this, this person who's, um, who loves me and who appreciates me and all this. But really, if, if you have another person that's talking about marriage and love and all of this within, you know, pretty much right away, the first few weeks that you're together, this isn't healthy. Like this is a big red flag that because if a person's going to, they don't know you, they don't know you well enough to love you. And they sure don't know you well enough to actually have a successful marriage. Right. Um, yep. And so when they leave, it's this, we're seeing the same thing, but in reverse, you know, yeah. It's, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. It is. Um, I, I remember I was, um, my, my ex actually didn't get married right away, at least <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Uh, but I found out he got married, um, while I was dating my current husband early in our relationship. And I had waited 
I mean, it. I guess. I guess maybe he waited an appropriate amount of time. But um, I had. I remember my my ex mother in law calling me to tell me for some reason. I don't know why she wanted to tell me. Um, and I. I personally, I didn't have a huge issue with it because again I guess I got lucky on that one but I know that I've seen I've had clients who were in like years-long relationships with these people and then 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 the person is suddenly they've, they've married one in particular in my in my mind the guy went and married someone else while they were in this relationship and then wanted to continue the relationship behind the wife's back I thought so it's effectively made her from being the the primary source of supply into the secondary source in one <laughs> swift motion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's horrible. It's, like you said, there's no empathy. There's no concern for how anyone else feels. And exactly what you noted, what is it? Um, it's called, um, it's the, the theory of object constancy, but they call it something when you can't be angry at, at someone at the same time as love them. The narcissists have this issue. They can't love you and be angry at you at the same time. It's like, object consistency or something Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so anyway i i think that's how they shift so quickly or at least part of it um and of course whatever makes them happy in the moment yeah yeah i mean it's entitlement it's um you know but really there's the connections that they make with other people just aren't just aren't that deep Mm -hmm. you know yeah so and there's different attachment styles um, that type of attachment style that narcissists and sociopaths tend to share and other people, a lot of trauma survivors in general tend to have this survival, uh, this um, attachment style. It's either uh, um, uh, dismissive avoidant or um, fearful avoidant, but generally dismissive avoidant. So there's nothing, they don't get attached. It's, it's very similar to um you know, a person who, I don't know, who raises and slaughters animals for a living, you know, they, they might really enjoy, I, I, they might really enjoy their animals and, um, you know, raising them and all of that, but they, they just realize this is just part of it. Like this isn't going, they're not, there's no depth of attachment there because it's that relationship's going to end. Right. right? That's a really great way to look at it it's I mean really dark but it's the same right. or and, and that uh, or it could be people that work with terminal patients or um you know we all have this within us is yep. to be able to put up these walls and a lot of times these walls um aren't conscious aren't a conscious thing like they just they happen, happen. For, and, and they happen for a lot of people early in childhood if a person has um trauma that happens. They just don't get attached to people after right. that. Yeah. Um, That's a really valid point. And I would think, I mean, I'm guessing, it, I know you were a psych nurse, but I'm sure you probably saw a little bit of death in your, <laughs> in mm-hmm. your time doing that. And I know um, in college I worked, I did in-home care for a while where I was, uh, I was not a nurse. I was just a, <laughs> a student, uh, but I had some background working in rehab places and helping people there. And this, um, I, I was able to go into a person's house for anywhere from overnight to three days to a week or whatever. Uh, but I would just do two and three day stints on the weekends cause I was at college and I, they, you know, whatever they paid me. And, and so what would happen is I would be living with these people short term, you know? And so I would want, I would feel myself wanting, you know, wanting to, or, or trying to attach to them almost emotionally, which was weird, um, but not, you know, I was still maintaining my professional distance. They were elderly people and there were certain situations where I felt really deeply for them. Like I remember being very overwhelmed by one family because they had all of their whole house was like a shrine to their life. You know what I mean? And I could mm. see all these photos of them having these amazing like adventures. And even though their house was outdated by like 30 years, <laughs> everything, you could just see their whole family's life in this house. And, and I remember just being like, oh my gosh, because the mother had lost, she had serious dementia and she was very rarely uh, lucid. Mm. And then the father was 
totally there uh, mentally, but physically he couldn't move around as much. And so it was this whole, and the, I shouldn't have, see, I'm calling them the mother and the father. And in reality, they were just my clients <laughs> mm-hmm. and they had children, <laughs> you know, the children were, were paying me to be part of their life, but it, it was just a, yeah, I don't know why I got off on that, but it, I get it <laughs> anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, um, oh. kind of having, a uh, appropriate connections, emotional connections for the situation is some, it's a part of healing too, yeah. because we do tend to, I think there's a lot of people that tend to be abused by, um, in general who, uh, are very, who, who place a significant amount of, um, um, like energy and time they're excessively emotionally reliant mm. on this other person they make their other like we're very quick to make this other person our whole world yeah and um and then that's devastating when that whole world ends if that person ups and leaves or turns out to be abusive and we're forced to leave uh, it's really really difficult so yeah. that kind of goes back to the whole need for a support group and having balance and added dimension in our life like it's important that we have things that we do that are nourishing to our soul you know that uh, that are fun that are fulfilling that give our life a sense of purpose that um you know that we're connecting in a positive way to kind of everybody and everything around us Mm -hmm. that's positive yeah yeah and I did remember why I, why I started talking about that. Okay. <laughs> because, because we were talking about not getting, how some people can be not attached or, or we can all have that ability to be not attached in the same way because we know the relationship will end with things like patience and things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's oh, a skill. I mean, sorry, that's, something, that's something that takes time. And, you know, when you have to learn the skill in a relationship that you mm-hmm. think is going to be forever, um, you know, that's, profoundly profoundly difficult yeah yeah absolutely um i just wanted to point out mo cowboy is here and i know that he raises animals so maybe he can give us some insight on i'm trying to see if he already did (laughs) some insight on on the um the comparison that you made because i thought that was a really really profound um okay anywho yeah um, so mo cowboy (laughs) sorry go ahead and here's a comment from Channel Tools. Mm. He says, the level of my anxiety has been extreme today because I found out that I have silverfish bugs in my mm. apartment. And then she went on to say, and when I see this, these bugs, I get extra needy and lonely and I want to call my exes so they will come and help me and save me. I get it. But let me tell you something that's going to be so much more satisfying than that, my friend. Go and get what you need. I don't know about silverfish, um, but I do know that if you can't hire an exterminator, I'm sure you can go to the local hardware store and get whatever they have. I don't know how hard they are to get rid of, and this is probably good, not good, but whatever you do, save yourself. Whether that means you hire an exterminator or you call your apartment manager and you say, get this handled because it's really their job, or you go and you bomb that place yourself, um, you're going to feel so much stronger. I can't tell you how satisfying it is when you handle a problem like that yourself and and then it's done. And then you're like, oh, I did it all by myself. Mm-hmm. And it feels so good to save yourself. Like, you know, save yourself queen. <laughs> There's some meme or something that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that something about like straighten your crown and blah, blah, blah. But my point is you can save yourself and it'll feel so much better than letting someone else save you truly just a thought yeah yeah Yeah, I agree there's a lot of uh kind of these stressful moments this can this can help too to keep a person um on track and away from toxic people is anticipating okay what are some triggers that do make you want to go reopen contact and want to go run to safety that's a valid point you know and And for a lot of people yeah it can't it could be bugs it could be um uh, you know, at home repairs in general can be like, oh my gosh, I can't take care of this house. I don't know how to do this. Or maybe it's not knowing how um, kind of some other life skills like budgeting or cooking or um, handling the kids or, uh, you know, it helps to write this stuff down. Like, okay, what's causing some overwhelm for me? And then that way you can go about 
addressing it specifically like you said and you go into the store and be like okay silverfish bugs are stressing me out what can i do about that right and don't yeah. forget about your friend google and your friend youtube <laughs> because <True. laughs> literally i i remember just not that long ago i kept waiting and waiting for a certain toilet in my house to get fixed and nobody was fixing it so you know what i did girl i went <laughs> to the hardware store and i bought the stuff and i got on youtube and I walked myself through it one step at a time, watching somebody else do it on YouTube, and I fixed it. And it felt so amazing to just be like, I don't need anybody else. I got this, you know? But, and again, hiring someone is still having that, okay? <laughs> but mm -hmm. in the case of living in an apartment, I'm 99% sure it is the responsibility of the apartment manager to deal with that. But tell me if I'm wrong, Dana. Do you think, I think it is in most cases. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but either way, save yourself. You're going to love it. It feels amazing. And if you can't save yourself on this one, just don't call the narcissist. <laughs> Get the apartment manager. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Then you've got a rat <laughs> mm. on top of your silverfish. You know, it just is compound. Yeah. It's not a solution. It's just compounding the problem. Yeah. Even if they do resolve the issue for you, it will be with strings attached. Don't forget. You know, but yeah. I get it. I totally get it. Why, why, you know, because maybe for many years before this, you wanted always, you know, or you always did call that person and that person, maybe that was one of their few redeeming qualities that they would help you with things like this. But, um, but the strings that come with that, I, I'm sure you already know, they're just not worth it. <laughs> and you'll feel so much better if you do almost literally anything else to fix it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think too, it can help um, to think of it. There's, uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank. There's this kind of this concept out there of um, kind of being like in your adult space and then being in your child space. Mm. And this we all experience this. It's it's interesting because it is oftentimes our unresolved stuff that's bubbling up. So it's like when we get triggered, when it's high emotional times, is when we tend to go between the two spaces. Mm -hmm. But if we're normally in our adult space, you know, it's, it's a sense of maturity. I can handle this. It's the ability to figure things out. It's the, um, you know, kind of making decisions that are good in the long term. And when we get triggered, we get scared, we get what, whatever might happen. Um, then we get knocked into that child space where it's like, oh my gosh, no, no, you know, bugs are icky, bugs are scary, or I don't know how to budget, or I can't be the one, I need somebody here to take care of me. And getting clear, acknowledging to yourself, okay, I am in this child space, what do I need to do to shift over back to the adult space? Seeing it that way is really powerful because yeah. it's wild when you realize, oh my gosh, I'm feeling fearful why am I feeling fearful? I'm, I'm scared that this relationship is going to end or I'm scared that this is going to happen. It's like, okay, well, well, what if it does? Yeah. You know? That's a, yes, that's an excellent, go ahead. Because those child fears tend to be um, you know, from that child point of view of, well, I don't want to be alone or I don't want them to abandon me or I don't want to be unlovable or, um, so there's a lot we can learn when those thoughts come up of, oh life some part of life is scary and we want to go run and find somebody else yeah. so that's worth exploring that for sure 100 and conquering it like you said angie yes it feels good it really does in order to be the um the the, the boss of your own life in order to but i'll tell you something really quickly also in, as, as you were saying this it occurred to me that there's something that i know about myself that all of you should also know about yourselves <laughs> and it's so silly and so simple but like there have been many times throughout my life where I've put off things that I thought were like hard to do or things that were a pain in the butt things that would take a long time many steps <laughs> procrastination uh, but what I know about myself for sure and what I've always known and this is why I've made it this far I think is that if I choose to do something if I need to do something if something I literally know that if I don't know the answer, I can get the answer. And if I can't get the answer, I can find somebody who has the answer. I, I guess what I'm saying is I can always resolve every situation as long as I just try. <laughs> and it sounds so simple and stupid. But like, for example, when 
I didn't know how to light the pilot light in my hot water heater when I was a single mom. Well, I figured it out, <laughs> you know, whether it's somebody came over and showed me and then I just had to remember, or back then we didn't really have as much of an internet situation. I mean, we had a little internet, but not much <laughs> um, compared to what we have today. Uh, but, but there's just a whole different, it's just a whole different world now. And you, you can really, thanks to the internet and those phones we all carry around, you can literally almost find out how to do anything and almost anything can you can maybe aside from like for surgery or something like that things you shouldn't do yourself uh you would be shocked how, how much you can really do if you give yourself um permission to think that you can so mm -hmm. and and the compassion to make mistakes along the way yeah you know because like, none okay, of us well, start off at the finish line that's right it's all right. this trial and error and falling down and getting back up again yeah and see your, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say and see your mistakes as, okay, well, that's not how we do it. <laughs> Learn right. that. <laughs> you know, yep. Figure out one more way that it, we don't do this. <laughs> right. And, and but don't be scared to laugh at yourself and just recognize this is part of becoming an independent person. You know, and, and so, and I'm about to, so, so we're talking about the bugs and we're talking about the, the pilot lights and things like that. This is all woman's stuff <laughs> and it's not woman's stuff, but do you know what I'm saying? These are things that a lot of women struggle with. There are things that men struggle with it. For example, paying bills or I, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm only talking from my own personal experience. I always tended to be the one mm -hmm. who paid the bills and managed the health insurance and did all the different things like that. And so if there are things, you know, regardless of whether you're female or male, there are probably things that someone else did for you that now you're like flailing or like Dana mentioned earlier, cooking or whatever. Um, and so like, I like to think of this as a good time to learn, like we've talked about, learn something new. If you don't want to learn it from YouTube or, or the internet in general, you can, there are free classes out there all over the place, you know, adulting classes <laughs> mm -hmm. and classes for how to have a budget, all that stuff is out there. So just don't be scared to, you're never, you're never too old to learn something new. And if you want to learn it, you can learn it, in my opinion. I mean, and if yeah. you can't, then find somebody who's willing to do it for you, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> there, that... There's um, a guy, I think his channel's going viral now. It's called Dad, How Do I? Yes. And I, lo I just love that concept. Love it's that a guy who's, whose own father mm -hmm. um, left him. So he didn't have a dad. And he decided he wanted to go and help other boys that didn't have a dad. And so his, and pro, I, again, I think it's relevant for girls too. It's a lot of things like how to for change sure. your oil, how to change a flat tire, how to um, tie a tie, how to shave, how to, yeah. you know, do these things. And it's really sweet. It is yeah. really sweet. And it's so needed because there's so much of this information out there that isn't given, especially right. in abusive or neglectful homes. I actually, this is so funny because a couple of years ago, I thought about making a mom channel like that, except not exactly like that, but a channel like where, you know, where I would be <laughs> the mom of the channel mm -hmm. because I know so many people, I mean, so many people, they don't have decent mothers and their mothers didn't teach them some of the things mothers should teach their children mm -hmm. and not not only but not only things that they can physically do and and whatever but also some of the emotional things and and things like that but I think maybe I'm serving better where I'm at for now but I I just I, I did think about doing uh, like a second channel like that just because a lot of people really need a mom and now I'm not going to because obviously we have <laughs> but mm -hmm. but I just I think it's such a a great idea and there's there's an emotional um part of the reason I think he's so successful so fast is because there is an emotion even for me sitting here right now <laughs> I have a little tear behind my eye because there is an emotional pull to something like that uh, because you do wreck you know you do uh, I, I didn't get that kind of relationship with yeah you know so I I, I get it but I think it's a cool thing and I like it <laughs> that he's doing that anyway because yeah. I, I yeah it's, it's neat. It's funny that you say that. Cause I've had the same thought of, except I wasn't thinking about a channel. I was thinking about, this was years ago, writing a book oh. about kind of just um, basically everything a person needs to know by the time they're 18. I love that. And, and, but probably doesn't. Right. Right. <laughs> and um, uh, I was, you know, my mom, she did a lot of things right. And she did 
make sure that I knew how to change a tire and how to check my oil and how to check the tire pressure in my car and I did learn that my, stuff too. in my tires and you know how to set up a budget and um but there were a lot of things that she didn't know in fact I was actually just talking to her last night we were talking about skincare and yeah. um she was asking me she's like oh you know your skin's looking really good and I was like oh, I've been on the skincare kick since quarantine and um it is looking really good. Well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's glowing. It, it okay, go glowing. on. <laughs> uh, and, and so she was telling me about her skincare process, which is totally not the way you take care of your skin at all, right? Oh. And, and I guess I knew this, but I just grew up with that because she just never really knew how to take care of herself because her yeah. mom never taught her. And um, I so I told her last night, I said, you know what, mom, I am sending you a package from Amazon with all of the stuff that you need to take care of your skin and That's awesome. call me when you get it and then we'll go through it all. But, you know, if we're not taking care of ourselves properly in certain ways, like we can't expect certain results if we're not doing the appropriate actions Yeah, kind of a thing. But if you don't know different, it's, you know, it's, it just seems like, oh, other people are just lucky, right? or they're more equipped, they just know they're better, they're smarter than me, or they're, you know, um, when their life seems to run easier, it's like, actually, no, it's just they know different things. But you right. can learn a lot of these things, too. And that can radically improve your life. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right on. Okay, let's see here. Here's a yeah, what you got? comment, or uh, I guess it's more of a comment from Hun Warrior. Who says, I've been dating someone for almost a year now after coming out from narcissistic abuse. Yesterday, we had a fight about something, and he didn't give me a safe zone to express myself, but turned the conversation on to how much I criticize him and how I have an opinion about everything. I'm totally torn now since he doesn't respect my boundaries, and I don't want to waste time in a relationship like that. Um, there has been other issues too in the past but the fact he didn't even let me talk or even later on the phone just acted like he didn't do anything wrong that is a rough one um i feel like there are certain um arguments that happen in normal relationships but but it sounds like you you weren't getting any positive um feedback Dana, can you I have to cough. Sure. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go. I'll talk while Angie's. Okay. <laughs> Getting her cough figured out. Um, yeah. Like Angie was saying, there's, you know, conflict and confrontation. That is a normal part of any relationship. It's not even just normal. It's healthy. Because when two people are being authentic, there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be a clash of opinions and, um, you know, cause we're not the same person. We're two different people. So it's not about avoiding conflict or confrontation, but it's about how does somebody handle that? And, um, this is something that I really wish I had learned years ago. It would have made a big difference is we can't really tell if the, re in my opinion, the relationship isn't really a relationship until it's weathered several storms of conflict and confrontation because there's it, it's easy to get emotionally involved or attached to somebody when everything is good um but that's not going to be the strength of a relationship the strength of a relationship is going to be how does each person handle it when the storms get rough and and so realizing that of yeah there's going to be these intense feelings it's important that we kind of keep these in check and we wait and tell the, these disagreements and conflict and confrontation and boundary setting and all of that until that begins to surface and how does each person react to that? So unfortunately, we all tend to do the opposite where we get very emotionally involved right away. We focus on everything we have in common. Um, you know, if sex is introduced right away, there's the focus on, oh, this person just, I feel, I feel good. My, I physically feel good um, with them. I there's things I really like about them. And then when things start to get rocky and you really see, oh, wow, we don't communicate the same way, or this person doesn't have the character that I thought that they did. It's difficult 
for us to potentially leave that relationship if we need to. And it's important that we're able to be assertive um, when we're disagreeing with somebody. And I don't know, communication is, to me, it's, it's everything. It's I agree. Everything. Yeah. I agree. I, I think you covered that pretty thoroughly. Um, and I think ultimately, if that person, and I, and I might have, to be honest, missed a couple of the details, Dana, because I was coughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think in general, if the person makes you feel unheard, um, unseen, I mean, you've been dating for a year up to this point, if this is the first time you're having this issue, and tell me, I hope I'm not saying anything opposite of what you just said, Dana. <laughs> um, but no, it's I, okay. You could, okay. <laughs> whatever you're thinking. Well, I think if it's the first time you've had the issue and you were able to talk about it or have been able to talk about it or will be able to talk about it and maybe resolve it, then maybe it's, not, you know, maybe it's worth going it, you know, checking. A year is a pretty good amount of time to not ever have had an issue and then have an issue like this. But I guess this also depends, of course, on how closely you were dating for the year. Did you live in the same area? Did you, you know, is this now suddenly you're together for the first time and you're, this is happening or you know, like, was it long distance first? You know what I mean? A lot of factors uh, measure in, but ultimately I think if you feel unheard, unseen, uh, invalidated consistently in the relationship, then, then maybe you have a choice to make that is hard. But otherwise I think there's a possibility to work through some stuff, especially if this is the first time in the relationship that you've had an issue like this. But then again, I, I, again, I may have missed a couple of the details because I was trying to keep myself from coughing to death. So I apologize for that. Yeah. I think it's getting clear um, and having that conversation with him of saying, you know, I really feel communication is important um, I want this relationship to be nourishing for both of us. And we had this issue a few days ago. Um, you know, it's okay if you need your space and you don't want to talk about things, that's okay to say, hey, you know what? I don't want to talk about this, um, but we do it now, but let's talk about it in a few days. Mm. You know, it's, it has to be, there has to be some sort of resolution made. Um, and so getting clear with yourself of like, what kind of communication are you looking for in a relationship? And then making that known to this other person of, Hey, you know what? I don't, I, um, this really upset me when, yeah. when this happened. And then you'll see if they're actually willing, um, you know, if they're, they, if they have the emotional maturity and the desire to be able to give you what you need. Yeah. Um, that's, I totally agree a hundred percent. I'm, I'm trying to find channel tools comments because I'm seeing that channel tools thinks that we are ignoring her. Oh, no, no. We, we, we addressed that earlier. We, we that was okay. the silver fish. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have other, do you have another question or do you want me to, I have a comment here. I don't know. Um, oh, no, well, here's a, another comment. Go from Hun Warrior. She says, we live apart, but I don't like his problem solving skills, plus the fact that he turned around the conversation, etc. Uh, yeah, you know, this is very valid when it's a huge turnoff when you yeah. realize, oh my gosh, this person um, deflects mm -hmm. and th they are not able to stay on topic. You know, if he's got issues with you, that's fine. Let's address one thing at a time and get them solved. That is Not, a valid point. But, you know, so yeah. it's that kind of stuff is crazy making. And but again, it goes back to, OK, if you can be assertive and he still does this. Some people just lack the skills and it's, you know, they may or may not ever develop them. And if there's other issues present, it's OK to be like, you know what, I don't have I'm not looking for a project. Right. Like, this is what I need in my life. This isn't working for me. Um, and then also in, in another big lesson I've learned in my life too, is to bring this stuff up early on in a relationship when you realize this is what's key. It's not having um, the same hobbies and, and morals and values, which that's definitely important. But at the end of the day, it's going to be that ability to communicate effectively with the other person. Yeah. And I don't like that, that he that he deflected 
what was happening and threw mm -hmm. other things at you. That's quite toxic. <laughs> um, just now that I have sort of got my head back yeah. in the game. Um, yeah, so I, I tiptoe if, if you don't run out the door um, mm -hmm. of the relationship. Um, yeah, okay, okay. So I wonder what if, if Hun Warrior has any feedback since, wait, I just saw something. Part, I thought, okay, okay, we're good. She said, thank you. <laughs> Here's a question. Okay. Uh, Jennifer says, my ex told my 15 year old son that I wrecked his life and my son was so mad at me and it was so sad. It ended one month ago after 20 years of abuse. What is the best way to deal with this? Okay. I can help you with this a little bit. Um, first of all, they're going to, um, he, he's trying to divide, you know, divide and conquer sort of by getting your son to be on his side and, and so on and so forth. If your son lived with both of you, chances are that you can probably explain to him pretty clearly. A 15 year old understands way more than some people know, you know, you're his mother. Um, my, my suggestion is to explain it to him as thoroughly as you can at his age level and ability to understand um, and, and say that you're sad too and this isn't what you wanted either, but this is, this is how you're gonna make sure that the rest of his childhood goes well. And this is how, you know, <laughs> You can even do the whole mom and dad both love you thing. Um, I'm sorry that your dad's having a hard time. I'm also having a hard time, but this is why we're doing this, you know, and, and maybe explain you don't have to ever tolerate abuse in your relationships. Um, and of course, also that you shouldn't do this, <laughs> point out what the abuse was. But ultimately at 15, you know, assuming that the child doesn't have any um, developmental disabilities, uh, cognitively, that's the right way to say it, right, Dana? Um, any, any cognitive disabilities, you should be able to sit down with him and explain to him exactly the truth uh, within reason. I mean, obviously you don't wanna talk about your sex life or anything like that, but if he saw you being abused verbally, psychologically, physically, or in any other way, you know, <laughs> the way I would look at it is look, dad chose to really you know by dad's behavior is what broke the family not my leaving you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. um dana do you have another thought on this so recap again the situation so uh, her ex told her 15 year old son that she wrecked his life and her son was upset with her basically that she wrecked the father's life or the son by life? leaving the the father's life i assume um by leaving the father mm -hmm. now the father's life is ruined and and my again my experience here is um talk to the kid tell the kid the truth and then just be there for the kid as much as you can don't talk bad about the dad only say facts go ahead dana yeah um i would agree with that i would um boy that i mean that's that can be considered parental alienation too mm. so that's really poisoning the well and in manipulating the child against the mom. Of course, that's the whole goal, so, right? Yeah. yeah. So I would, um, I would probably contact your attorney, frankly, as well, and would say this is what he said, and, um, you know, if there, and I, so I'd start documenting this kind of stuff, yes. date, and who said what, and. Mm -hmm um and let your attorney know because her son told her she was the abuser well sorry i'm only i didn't mean to interrupt you um can you hear me yeah okay her she just typed that her son told her she was the abuser um and i didn't mean to interrupt but i agree with everything you're saying dana and and jennifer could could benefit from this but in this case he's already kind of been sort of twisted so just really quickly in addition to everything Dana is saying at this point I would tell your son again I would no emotions only facts here here even show him a video of like maybe some experience that you relate to that he'll see and go oh wow you know or simply just say here are the facts I love you and I'm here if you want to talk you know I don't know go ahead Dana mm -hmm. Um, yeah, some other ideas would be, um, I don't know if you have full custody or 
and this is going to depend on the state too, but a lot of domestic violence shelters um, also often offer free children's counseling. Mm. So if you are the the primary parent, um, you might want to see about getting him in uh, once a week with a children's counselor, just so he can have a place to vent and kind of help work through this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's that's an option. As I, I would focus on um, rebuilding the relationship with your son. And this is going to, the older they are, the more difficult this gets. Yes. So uh, right now, um, some of the things that you can do are uh, to have um, um, kind of compassion and empathy for, uh, and curiosity for, okay, well, I wonder why your dad would say that. Or I wonder, right. um, you know, well, you know, well, why do you think, um, you know, well, what do you, what would, what do you think would have been a good way to handle this if somebody was being mistreated or um, to kind of explore their emotions and then to just have empathy. Yeah, I can imagine this is really, this must be very difficult to have to go back and forth between mom and dad and um, to have, you know, uh, I bet that probably makes you sad and mad for your dad when he says things like that you know, um, cause you don't want to see him hurt and then really focusing on doing, uh, fun bonding activities with your son to keep the relationship that you have as strong as possible, whether or not your, your ex intentionally or unintentionally, um, is kind of poisoning the well with this kind of stuff. I mean, sometimes, oftentimes adults say things, even, um, you know, mature adults, but, you know, immature adults that have a history of being abusive and have kind of a skewed mindset and perspective about how they should treat others. Um, they particularly do. They say stuff and it manipulates, it brings other people to their point of view when their point of view is pathological. So abusive people always think, I mean, you know, nine and a half out of 10 times, they think they're the victim. Yeah. You know, how dare you set boundaries? How dare you tell me no? Look at everything I've done for you. Um, they minimize their bad behavior and raise up everything that they've ever done. And um, they believe that they should treat other people based on how they feel. Oh, I'm frustrated and angry. That's why I cussed at you or yelled at you or hit you or spit you on you or whatever. Um, so they always feel justified in their mistreatment, but that's because they're lacking boundaries. And what yeah. is a, a considered a, appropriate mature behavior. So, um, but like I said, I would, I would encourage you to spend time bonding with your son. That's going to be the number one thing right now to try to undo a lot of this because his anger is coming from, he sees his dad as being the victim in all of this. And so, uh, and there's trauma bonding, I'm sure. Involved. Yeah. And, you know, and, yeah. and I think it's a kind of a normal human thing, right? When somebody is telling you know, oh gosh, you know, your mom just really hurt me so bad, or your dad just really hurt me to want to defend that parent. Yeah. And so and maybe bonding... your efforts to, to help to shield him from it have actually caused him to think you're really okay. You know, so maybe you should let him see you cry sometime or if that happens naturally, you know what I mean? I, I know a lot of, I, I just want to throw this in really quick, Dana. Um, my husband's mother, um, mm -hmm. she, when, when she, her, her husband passed away on the way home from her mother's funeral in the car. Yeah. He had a heart attack. Okay. I know I told you that before, right? It's yeah. a terrible story. And I never, I always would ask her, how did you survive that? You know, but anyway, uh, the point is that one of the things that she did wrong, she did so many things, right? She was an amazing lady, but one of the things she did wrong was she tried to hide her grief from her children a lot, almost completely. She, she tried really hard to stay positive for them and, and, in doing that, her children thought they weren't supposed to be crying about grandma and dad, and they felt weird about their tears, and so they tried to hide that stuff, mm -hmm. and it messed with their heads a little bit, and she, literally, this woman was amazing, and I would never, I'm not trying to talk bad about her. I'm just saying, in her desire to keep them safe, unfortunately, she let them think that there was no... Um, that it maybe mm -hmm. wouldn't was appropriate for them to cry, and so they were confused 
well, mom's not crying, so I guess we're not supposed to cry, you know. And so sometimes, I guess my point is they thought their mom didn't feel sad about this horrible tragedy in her life. And, and maybe sometimes as moms, we do want to protect our children from maybe the abuse we're going through or from the, the depth of our pain. And so we, we smile and we keep trying to pretend everything's okay. So maybe in Jennifer's case, maybe she, and Jennifer, tell me if I'm wrong, but maybe in your effort to keep him safe emotionally from seeing you crying or upset or, or fighting or whatever, that might have caused him to think, well, she's fine. <laughs> and then your your yeah. husband or your ex would play the, the poor me card, which is typical of a narcissist who doesn't get what they want, you know? So, yeah. Sorry, Dan. I, you know, and I think there's validity, um, you know, because there's kind of that line there between um, kind of being open and honest with the child about certain emotions and then unintentionally um, uh, parentifying them, you know, making them kind of feel responsible for our emotions. But I think your child's at the age, you know, they're 15, that they can handle, um, they can handle your emotions and then they can handle an honest conversation about it. And so if they're saying, well, dad said that you ruined his life, to be like, you know, uh, wow, that must have validating him. That must have been really hard to hear. I, I bet that that made, you know, you upset with me and I don't blame you. I just want you to know my intention was never to ruin your father's life. And it was never, I never wanted to, to get a divorce. I, you know, I love you. It breaks my heart that we're here now and that you have to go back and forth and that all of this is going on this is not what i wanted by any stretch i did this because i had to everything you just said is gold and i totally agree with you um as the mother of two well one almost teenager and one 16 year old and the other older one <laughs> um that's gold and and you're absolutely 100 percent right you must validate their feelings and thank you for saying that. That's so, so important. I, I wanna share a couple of comments really quick um, from for Jennifer from Enchanted Order Art and Crystal Mountain. Uh, Enchanted Order says, you may not find a resolution to it anytime soon. My ex definitely groomed our son to be a narcissist like him. So having a relationship with him now is next to impossible for me, which sucks. But you still in the, in my, I wanna just say, you're still in the area where you can affect this positively. Um, and then there was one from Crystal Mountain. Where is it? Ah, I can't find it, but she basically, uh, she agreed with what Dana was saying about document, document, document. <laughs> it does help and it can help in, in the divorce proceeding. Oh, she says, no, Enchanted Order Art added, my son has gone into the Marines now, haven't spoken to, to him since then, but it's his choice. He knows where to find me. And this is a painful thing to hear for a mom who's where Jennifer is right now. Um, but, but it is also a cautionary tale. At 15, there is a chance that you can kind of pull him back in and, and bring him back around to the truth. And I think counseling is is one really positive way like Dana was saying they have sometimes they have at shelters and, and I'm sure you can find a, a domestic violence counselor or someone who can maybe show him the way um, or even depending on where you're at and what your situation is maybe even a coach can kind of fill him in on that um, but it's it doesn't matter until he's ready to hear you but everything what Dana said about validating him that's number one and when you do that over and over again <laughs> uh, and I don't mean that you should always be like not in a ridiculous way, but in an honest, genuine way when he speaks to you, you know, I hear what you're saying and this, you know, exactly how Dana expressed it was perfect. And I think that's so important for all parents, for kids of all ages to think about one of the things we didn't get from those of us who had toxic parents, didn't get one of the most painful parts of this abuse from childhood into adulthood and with our exes and everything else is we don't get validated that is horribly painful if you think about never being validated it's you know and so thank you good point yeah and and a big part of that too, and this depending on the relationship you have with your ex mm -hmm. um actually it might be good to send an email i was gonna say it's worth a phone call but i would keep a paper trail of it so i would just say it very uh kind of keep it polite professional brief and then be gone kind of yep. a thing so letting him know uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Johnny came home the other day and was really upset and had said that uh, you had told him that um, I had ruined your life. And now he's upset with me. 
and I just want you to know whether, um, you know, it's please, that kind of stuff can really poison the well. And, um, you know, I know that you're upset with me uh, for filing for divorce. Believe me, I didn't want to do this. Um, you know, it's okay. And of course that, that he's going to say, oh, well, so I'm not supposed to show my emotions or this, that, or the other. So it's okay for you to feel sad or to be frustrated or to be angry or whatever, but it's really important that we both um, are careful about what we say. So we don't poison the well. And it's, and I would put in there too, it's called parental alienation. Yes. And it's yes. something that we both need to be aware of. So that way you're not attacking him. You're just informing him mm -hmm. and you're also validating his feelings. Yeah. So, um, even though he doesn't deserve it. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> no, but it's, you're dealing but with you're emotionally right. immature person who doesn't understand and, like their damaging yeah. behavior. So, um, and you're keeping a paper that that paper trail is so, so important too. And so. you're letting him know that you're on it. And yeah. so I think if you call him out on it in a, um, a polite, uh, assertive, kind of non-emotional way, and then just mm -hmm. kind of dropping in there, you know, this this kind of stuff, it's known as parental alienation, and it's really damaging to kids. It's something, I think, and make it a we thing, that yeah. we need to be on the same side to not, to be aware of this kind of stuff and to not engage in it, um, you know? And then back to the bonding stuff. So that's the number one thing that you can do to help kids to stave off this manipulative behavior is to really double triple down on fostering that relationship with them it's bonding with them in ways that they want to be bonded with a lot of parents are like oh we're gonna go um do this activity that i think we should do as a family or that i want to do as a parent instead of and then the kids are like oh geez I, I, we gotta go pick apples or we gotta go for a country picnic or whatever you know what i mean and they're not feeling it so those activities aren't bonding for them they're more of a, a got to than mm -hmm. a get to so if your child is really into at whatever video games um or uh at, you know has a favorite tv show or netflix show or whatever sitting together interacting over stuff that they're interested in because this is you as the adult trying to foster the relationship the burden is not on the child to foster the relationship with with you so meeting them where they are is going to be a lot more successful normally i recommend things that it's difficult because we're in quarantine now mm -hmm. um but i'm a big fan of going to like these uh oh, what do they call them the escape rooms um oh yeah because it's very team oriented yes. and there's it's also a lot of the same um feelings of kind of it's that line between fear and excitement so a lot of the same type of trauma bonds the chemical activity that happens during um trauma it happens also in exciting fearful based things so it's it's a very bonding activity if you can find things like that that mm -hmm. um you can go through it together yeah, it's a great kind idea. Thing. Even great watching suggestion. kind of scary shows mm -hmm. creates yeah. that feeling of we That's went right. through this together that you'll get a lot more bang for your buck with mm -hmm. that kind of stuff than you will with, um, you know, making a cake. Yeah. But so. even then, even making a cake is such a bad thing. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's whatever, whatever they're into, you know, yeah, if, you, totally. if your son is into baking, <laughs> pick out, have him pick out some recipes and let's make them, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think that those are excellent, excellent suggestions. I'm totally with you on on that. And we've got some really good stuff in the in the chat as well. Um, holy shamolies, we are a little over. Oh, time. we sure are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, by the way, I do have the wrench, just so you know, um, <laughs> in your chat, the wrench. Oh, okay. Yeah, you yeah. are an admin. Okay, yeah. great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> do you want to do any more questions or what's your situation? I don't know what you're, um, I'll just mention real quick. Jennifer's talking about, um, you know, children's therapists and this kind of stuff too. And again, Jennifer, I would encourage you when you approach your ex with this, because oftentimes a lot of States will require if, especially if there's, um, a joint custody agreement of any kind mm -hmm. that, uh, both parents will need to sign off for it. And, 
you also need to ask the therapist what are the rights um, because privacy laws vary from state to state and a lot of times a parent can legally say I want to know everything that's being said in this session so you would want to find this out but I would approach it with your ex in terms of um, that this it, and this is really what it is I mean this isn't lying or anything but that you want to give your son a place for him to explore his feelings that you're not it's and neutral yeah 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 and um I, w- I want to just point this out and again it does vary by state but I know in Missouri um that you must when your child is 15 you have to then have your child give you permission to see their medical records um I know this in a hard because I came across it the hard way so like that's how, so check in your state he may not have a right to see the records without your child's signature depending on where you live so um I don't know how that how the court would affect that but I'm sure they that like Dana said you can request to see what you want to see so yeah okay yeah. sorry just want to throw that in there because yeah, I, I know re- it's- yeah. <laughs> yeah. With both of my boys, uh, when, when they hit 15, I, the first time it happened, I was really mad <laughs> because I couldn't uh, access his stuff online anymore until he signed some paper. And the second time I was prepared. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Okay. Good, good. Uh, yeah. Good and you may clarify, absolutely. This is what we were talking about. She says, definitely a paper trail not for the lawyer, not for the son. Yes. Um, it would overwhelm him. Oh, yeah, of absolutely. Course. No, this is just for court. court. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, that goes back to that unintentional parentification where, um, and I know UA, UNA is, knows a lot about this, but like uh, keeping adult, um, you know, uh, parental responsibilities on the parent and not putting them on the child. So the child doesn't need to know about the details of court or he said, she said, or, um, any of that. Cause they, they just, it's not helpful. Right. And it just creates anxiety and poisons the well. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, uh, binge walking the walking dead, by the way, totally a good bonding activity with you on that. <laughs> she said her and her daughter watching that. I, I do that with my kids too. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Oh gosh. I got through maybe two episodes I was making I was watching them by myself in the dark and I'm like okay I'm done I'm done I'm never- scary in the dark by yourself yes. <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good one though yeah it is yeah let's see do you want to do one more question here sure um let's see do you have one I'm looking I'm looking to mm-hmm. let's see oh I was going to mention there's um, a strategy out there it's basically working with kids. It's mainly used for working with kids that um, have a, like a reactive attachment disorder or signif- basically significant trauma that tends to result in reactive attachment disorder. I think it's great, frankly, I think it works well with, um, with pretty much anybody, <laughs> frankly, uh, especially kids that are in this kind of a situation where there's manipulation going involved or involved and it's an acronym it's it's pace p-a-c-e and it stands for uh playfulness acceptance curiosity and empathy Mm. and so this is the effective approach and um the playfulness involves uh, kind of that bonding with them so it, the whole the whole kind of uh, theory behind this approach is that connection has to happen first before correction. It's so spot on. So a lot of really traumatized kids they don't form, they're not they don't form at- attachments, deep attachments right. to other people, and and so it's kind of developing that level of playfulness, that level of bonding, the mm-hmm. um, acceptance of how they feel. So not trying to argue with them, not trying to change it, not trying to, you know, defend it, or mm-hmm. you know, you're just accepting it. This is how they feel. Um, and then like the curiosity, trying to explore why they might feel that way, or why did they do a certain thing? If they acted out and they, you know, um, kicked a hole in the door, okay, well, what was going on? 
you know, were you feeling frustrated? Were you feeling angry? Kind of what led up to you kicking this hole through the door, do you think? And then the right. empathy of that must be really difficult to have, you know, to have failed this test after you studied so hard for it and now you're frustrated or, you know, dad said some stuff and now you're frustrated and you wanted to get back at me. Yeah. So that's powerful. Yeah, yeah. it is. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I think I am going to have to go because I have an appointment okay. I just forgot about. Um, but okay. I do apologize. But do you want me to let you answer another question? Or not? Like, I'll just sign off and or no 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 that's okay off. i think that's okay. i think that's good okay um okay. yeah okay Sorry, guys. Guys. <laughs> we will see yeah, that's okay we'll see you guys next week over on angie's channel um angie atkinson over on youtube and um yeah 1 30 p.m eastern standard time to around 2 30 ish eastern standard time we alternate channels so if this is something that you're interested in please subscribe to both of us and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for being here, Angie. Always my pleasure. Sorry, okay. I have to rush off. That's okay. I'll talk, I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Sounds good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.